Uh, last week, we did uh, People's War, or Guerrilla War, if you want to call it that, uh, from the people's point of view. And I mentioned that Ho Chi Minh, uh, Mao Zedong was another one, organized the peasant to fight. That was their army. And in Vietnam, as in China, this is based off the village system. This is where these people live. And if you recall last week, I mentioned, uh, you know, Ho, Ho, was, Ho Chi Minh's more of a revolutionary nationalist than he was a communist. But, you know, when you go back to 1919, when he goes to Versailles, believing in Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, that after this war, people are going to be able to determine their own fate, finding out that's not quite the truth here. You know, this idea that Woodrow Wilson was propounding this war was fought for democracy. If this war was fought for democracy, how come the British and the French kept their colonies and Germany lost hers? So obviously here, this war wasn't just fought for democracy. Uh, that's, a, that's a come on, basically what that is. Because the French are going to keep, the British and the French are going to keep their colonies to help rebuild their economy, supposedly, after this war. I'm talking about the Great War, 1914, 1918. And this war helps to spur these revolutionary nationalists, especially when a country like, or an area like uh, Southeast Asia is going to remain in the fold of the French colonial empire. All right, so these people know they have no outside help, so they're going to go to where help exists. Perhaps the Soviet Union, which is espousing this proletariat revolution, socialist orientation, so on and so forth, in direct opposition to the foreign imperialist powers. I'm talking the British, the French, and they're going to lump the United States into this. And rightly so, since the 1898 war, Spanish-American War, we grabbed the Philippines, we grabbed Guam, we grabbed Puerto Rico, and Cuba became a free nation, if you believe that one. But the fact of the matter is, yes, this is, this is this backlash to the colonial agenda, you know, the imperialist agenda. Uh, of course, we know what the Soviet Union is going to be, what's going to turn into, so, so much for the proletarian revolution. They're going to give lip service to that, just like the West gives <coughs> lip service to democracy. Having said that, caught in the middle are people like the Chinese, people like the Vietnamese, who are looking to throw off this yoke of imperialism. In Vietnam, it's the French. Of course, in 1940 and 1941, the Japanese are going to invade uh, Southeast Asia because they want to stop that flow of supplies that, that, Chiang Kai, that Franklin D. Roosevelt is selling, sending to Chiang Kai-shek. And that's crossing the border from northern Indochina into China. So the Japanese are going to cut that road off. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to cut that route of supplies. Having said that, this is where you begin to see Ho Chi Minh and his gang begin to coalesce the so-called guerrilla army. And it's interesting, in 1944, going into 1945, they have about 30, 40 people. And yet, in five months, this is going to grow to 5,000. And here you begin to see the United States recognizing, recognizing that the real, really, the sole, you know, the, the, the sole organization fighting the Japanese are the Viet Minh, or the communists. And many OSS agents who are parachuted in come to the realization, and Archimedes L. Patty is one of them. He wrote a book called Vietnam, Prelude to America's Albatross. The book is about this thick. But if you're into Vietnam and how we got involved, I suggest you read that book. The guy was an OSS agent. And he says, we can work with this guy. And there is a point in the United States where, yes, we thought of working with this guy, Roosevelt. And Wendell Wilkie was another one in 1940. Remember him? He ran for president. Yeah, believing that the French should not get Southeast Asia back. You know, Roosevelt at one point even agreed that the French were treating these people in a very draconian manner. Of course, as 1944 blends into 1945, and as what you call the Second World War is winding down, there's a change of heart here. That maybe to make sure that France stays in the Western fold, that we allow them to have that empire back. And that's exactly the tact we're going to take. Of course, understand one thing. One of the reasons they want to keep countries like France and Italy in the Western fold is that, you know, Washington understands Italy had a sizable communist party. France had a sizable communist party. 
Spain, even under Franco, had a sizable Communist Party. You know what's fascinating about the Communist Party in France when the war is over with? The Communist Party in France votes to try to keep Vietnam in the French colonial system. <laughs> Boy, they became flaming nationalists. This is even recognized in Vietnam. Boy, our brethren sold us down the river. Which shows you what? Every man for himself here? Yeah, that's about it. Well, what happens on August 6th? The United States drops the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, right? Followed three days later by another atomic bomb on Nagasaki. Four days after that second bomb, the Indo-Chinese Communist Party Central Committee meets in its ninth plenum at Tan Trao. They're organizing their post-war program for running this country. And one of the ideas that's put forth is a general uprising. And this is going to be put forth at the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the party rally three days later. However, on the 14th, you know, events are speeding along here. On the 14th, Emperor Hirohito announces that Japan surrenders. They finally gave up the ghost after two bombs. The two days later, on the 16th, that central that, that, that party rally occurs. The Party Congress of the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. And they set their agenda, a general uprising. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to occupy as many of the provincial and district capitals that they can. And they're going to try to take over the government and proclaim their own government and Vietnamese independence. And they begin to put this operation in, in, in place. And they're going to take over a lot of the district and, and, and provincial capitals. Now keep in mind here, the communists are well endowed up north. They're well organized up north. Less so in the center of the country, Annam, and the southern part of the country, Cochin, China. It's true they are going to take over Saigon by the, by the, end, of, by the end of August 45. However, out of a nine-man committee that runs the country, six are communists. But they cannot maintain their hold in the south as they can in the north. Of course, this is a difference between northern Vietnamese and southern Vietnamese, too. Having said that, having said that, at this point, you're getting closer to September 2nd, 1945. That's the day the Japanese are going to sign the surrender on the battleship Missouri officially ending the war. The same time, it's fascinating, the same time <coughs> Ho Chi Minh is addressing a half a million people with the new Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. A Declaration of Independence that is based off our Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of 1789. Well, you know, Ho Chi Minh was an admirer of George Washington. That's fascinating in itself. And he's, he calls, he, makes, he gives a roster of French crimes against the Vietnamese people. Also, call, God bless you, also calls on, also calls on uh, the world to respect Vietnamese independence. Of course, if, if Ho Chi Minh had had his way, he would have had the United States occupy Vietnam at this point. He would have had the United States occupy Vietnam. And the reason for that is, let's go back to the Potsdam Conference, July 45. It is there it's agreed upon by the major powers that in lieu of the French coming back, British troops will occupy what you call South Vietnam, and Chinese troops will occupy what you call North Vietnam. And they will divide the country in half. The British, when they get there, you know, liberate all the French troops that have been rounded up by the Japanese. And the French troops are beginning to, gonna, they're gonna begin to really try to organize the country under French tutelage. <coughs> up north, it's a different story. The Chinese army that's occupying North Vietnam, Chiang Kai-shek is still in power. That is a right-wing agenda, the Kuomintang. And they are gonna try to cater to right of center nationalist parties in the north in an effort perhaps to foment a satellite below the Chinese border. This is what Chiang Kai-shek is going to do. And he, and he occupies the north with 180,000 Chinese troops. 
Now keep in mind what the Chinese are doing. The British aren't doing this, but the Chinese are. They're looting this country. Looting it. You know, that's, that's, that's what the, the Soviet Red Army troops were doing in Eastern Europe. You know, you know what's fascinating about that? I know, I, you, maybe you've talked to maybe your, your uncles and your fathers about their experiences in World War II. You know, American troops looted French villages, too. Let's understand that if you talk to American troops. But, uh, but they're, they're interesting. Uh, I know a guy, Ed Connors, was in Patton's Third Army. He's since passed on. He says, you can always tell when American troops looted a French village. He says, they, they used to grab stuff, uh, forks, knives, whatever. He says he even saw a grandfather clock taken. Now you're going into battle. What are you going to do with a grandfather clock? <laughs> Beg your pardon? Hide behind it. Hide it. behind it. He says, hide behind it. <laughs> he says, but you'd leave that village, and as these guys are marching off to the next fight, you know, it dawns on them, well, I can't carry all this stuff. So there's all this stuff on the roadside, including the grandfather clock. <laughs> However, Soviet troops are interesting. They're, in, they're into this area some Soviet troops would call bourgeois Europe, getting into Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. And you know what Russian troops would take? <coughs> Light bulbs. Light bulbs. No American or British soldier would take a light bulb. Soviet troops would. Why? Shortage of them back home. That's if your house had electricity. China's doing the same thing in North Vietnam. They're looting the place. However, Ho is smart. He knows he doesn't have the strength to throw the Chinese out. He urges his followers, do not in any way provoke the Chinese occupiers. Do not provoke them. And he actually agrees with the Allies to admit the French back into Vietnam. That does not set well with his followers. Not at all. And there's a backlash. Party meetings, backlash. And Ho tells them, you folks have forgotten your history. You have forgotten your history. He says, Western colonialism is dead. It's dead. He says, and he, and he, and he reinforces this point by telling his followers, I would rather sniff French crap for 25 years than eat Chinese crap for another thousand. Point well taken? Yeah, because China, China ran Vietnam on and off for almost a thousand years. Ho remembers this. That if the Chinese go and the French come back, they won't be here long. Was he right? Yes. Yes. However, at the same time, it's interesting that while, the, while China is still in North Vietnam and they're trying to assemble a national congress here because of the pressure of the Kuomintang in China and the French army in North Vietnam, the, Viet, the communists have to accede to, to Chinese pressure. Out of 350 seats, supposing this new national congress that they're going to have for the gov for government of Vietnam, 70, 70 seats have to be, no matter the elections, have to be set aside for right-wing parties. Well, what's going to happen here is the Viet Minh are going to win 300 seats. This shows you how popular uh, Ho Chi Minh is. But that, that, sa that said, again though, as, as, the, as the British and the Chinese evacuate and the French take over, they begin to insert their troops. Again, French and Viet Minh are, are, are under negotiations here. You know, what they're doing, the, the French are going to occupy South Vietnam before coming into North Vietnam. And negotiations begin, be, begin between the French and the North Vietnamese, or the Viet Minh. The French are willing to admit that the Democratic Republic of Vietnam is not independent, but they can have their own government. They can have their own army. They can arrange their own financial scheme. However, they have to allow French troops back into the fold, back into Vietnam. And they want Vietnam to become part of this new so-called French Union. Now, it's, you know, again, things, it's all in the terminology here. You know, the French colonial empire is no longer called the French colonial empire. It's called the French Union. This is an attempt to try to conform to post-World the World War II reality. All these revolutionary nationalisms, they do not want to be run by colonial powers anymore. They want to be independent. 
But to keep them in the fold and in, in, in the maintained primacy of Vietnam, they're, they're, and created, the French are creating the impression that these people will be independent, but involved in a French union. They try to do the same thing with Morocco. They try to do the same thing with Algeria. The Vietnamese are under no illusions about this. At the same time, as French troops begin to pour into this country, end of 45, going into 46, Ho again tells his followers, tells the Viet Minh army, do not provoke the French. It's not what he wants to do at this point. In fact, he goes to France and he has to sign an agreement with the French, allowing the French back in and the French virtually not, oh, not overseeing the country, but still, you know, encroaching in this country. They're really not free. This, is kind, this kind of alludes to what the British did to Iraq. You know, the British mandate in Iraq ran out on October 3, 1932. And Iraq was supposed to be this sovereign nation among the family of nations while involved in the League of Nations. So using that as a starting point, Iraq's only 83 and a half years old here, folks. That's all it is. However, it's not sovereign. Because in 1930, the British government uh, made an agreement with Nuri as-Sayed, their lackey sitting in Baghdad. Uh, the British could station troops in Iraq anytime they want, anytime they wanted to. The British could use Iraq as a thoroughfare, moving troops from one side of Iraq to the other. Guess who controls the oil? The Brits. Guess who controls the intelligence service? The British. <coughs> And Baghdad had to get an OK from London for any major foreign policy decisions. Does that sound like an independent country or a sovereign nation? No. Well, this is what the French are looking to do in Vietnam. However, at this point, as 1946 goes on, toward the end of the year, uh, you know, the French are putting more troops into Vietnam. And fighting does break out, especially when the, especially when the French shell high fong and kill upwards of 6,000, 7,000 plus people. The Viet Minh in December 1946 began to attack French positions in Hanoi and the war is on. However, the French weight of, of conventional forces is just too much. The Viet Minh have to evacuate the cities that they taken. This is especially true in the south. They're not going to have as much of a hold here. But the Viet Minh have to, get out of, have to get out of Hanoi. And they are going to resort to something they do best, guerrilla warfare. Now the French are going to prosecute their case into 1947, trying to push the communist guerrillas not only out, but destroy them back toward the Chinese border. Of course, one thing is going to help the Vietnamese by 1949. And that's the civil war in China. Because who's going to win that civil war in China? No. Mao Zedong, right. Chiang Kai-shek is finished. So the Viet Minh now have an ally just across the border in the north. And that is going to be an important aspect for the Viet Minh victory. Because now Chiang Kai-shek is gone. That right-wing government in China is gone. Mao is now in power. However, even into 1948, and even in the 1948, the guerrillas are beginning to turn the war against, against the French. You know, guerrilla wars, I mentioned last week, with people's war, guerrilla wars take a long time. Especially when those guerrillas are set for, that, set for that duration. You know, they're willing to take losses. They believe in what they're fighting for. That's the important thing. Believe in what you're fighting for. Believe in what you're fighting for. And they do. They do not really a communist agenda. It's to unite the country. Again, revolutionary nationalism. So in, by 1948, going into 1949, Ho's army, commanded by Bo Win Jiap, has about a quarter of a million men. Although Jiap makes a few mistakes here. He begins to think with a quarter of a million men that he has the manpower to engage the French in conventional warfare. And he's going, to lose, he's going to get his nose bloodied three times. He backs off and goes back to guerrilla warfare. The idea here is to outlast the French. And now with China gone red, with Mao Zedong, 
They now have unlimited supplies and sanctuary to the north. That's big, sanctuary. And that's going to help them in the war against us, the Second Indochina War. What you call this now is known in history as the First Indochina War. They don't call it the Vietnam War, the First Indochina War. Having said all that, yes, you begin to see here the guerrillas begin to turn us around in France. In France, you know, it's beginning now. This is beginning to be a hard sell with the French people. 1947, 1948, 1949, going into 1950, and guess what's happening? Guess what else is happening here too? Expenses. This is costing the French a lot of money. Guess who's taking up the slack here for the French taxpayer? That's it, the United States. The United States. Well, that's not surprising here. That's not surprising here. Keep in mind, by 1950, 1951, let's, 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 see, let's look at what's happened here. Czechoslovakia went, went totally red. 1948, the revolution, the coup, sponsored by Moscow. 1949, don't the Soviets explode an atomic bomb? Yeah, they do. 1949, Mao Zedong wins in China. Nine, June 25, 1950, while the Viet Minh are fighting the French in Vietnam, what does North Korea do? Cross the 38th parallel, and now the Korean Civil War is on, a civil war that will draw in powers from outside the United States, Britain, you know, the, the United Nations, and China. And China. And that is no longer a civil war after, after Inchon. It's virtually what? An international conflict at this point, and which will turn into a two-year stalemate once the Chinese are in it. That's going on the same time Vietnam is. So the United States is going to support the French. That's exactly what they're going to, even if the American taxpayer has to do it. Let's understand one thing here. The American taxpayer was in Vietnam before the American soldier really was. In fact, just to let you know, in, by, the, by 1954, the American taxpayer was footing 78% of the French bill to the tune of, and this, this is 1953, 1954 dollars, not that inflated currency you have now, 1.063 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Today that might be chump change to some people, like the Cokes or somebody like that. But back then, that's money. You know, when the dollar bought a lot more. And this is a losing effort. Because going into 1952, 1953, it's decided here the Viet Minh are winning. And they're freeing up more of the North. They're taking control of more of the countryside. And more people are gravitating to this movement every day. Until finally General Navarre is made commander of French forces. Now keep in mind the North Vietnamese are using neighboring Laos just like they will use Cambodia in the war against us. Remember the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Right. Well, they're using Laos the same way. And the French now, the French commander, Navarre, wants to cut off that supply. And if you look at that map in that handout I gave you, which, is, which I like that map because it breaks down Vietnam into districts. If you, go to the up, if you go to the upper portion of Vietnam on the left, the northwest corner, you will see Dam Bien Phu. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the battle itself. That you can get in the military channel. But Dam Bien Phu is interesting politically. Keep in mind, it's only about 15 miles or 15 kilometers from the Laotian border. The idea here is for the French to occupy this place to cut out the supply line. However, Viet, you know, Dan Bien Phu is interesting. Even General, I, President, General, President Eisenhower looked at this on a map. You know, Dan Bien Phu is in a bowl. It's in a bowl. There's an airfield there. And there's going to be upwards of 15,000 troops there eventually. And Eisenhower took a look at this and said, why would you want to put your troops in a bowl if you can't control the surrounding mountains? Well, what do you think Geoff's going to do here? He's eventually going to insert some 55,000 troops in the mountains around Dien Bien Phu, plus 50,000 support troops, 
plus 100,000, we'll call them coolies, schlepping supplies from the Chinese border down here, which is over 300 kilometers. At one point, 1,500 tons a day is coming across the Chinese border. Vietnamese artillery, which I don't want to burst your bubble here, but guess where they got some of this artillery from? Yes. Yeah, us. You know, you know, some of this was what the Chi what the Russians captured from Chiang Kai-shek's army and turned over to the Chinese, or what the Chinese themselves captured, 75 millimeter U.S. artillery pieces, 105 millimeter. Besides the besides the artillery pieces that they got from the Soviet Soviet Union, and what they were digging, that what they were doing is digging in the surrounding mountains. They were putting their artillery in these caves and tunnels. And they would fire some rounds and then draw them back into the tunnel so they couldn't be pinpointed by French aircraft. But keep in mind, you know, the battle starts early March 1954. And the airfield at this point is essentially useless by the end of March because of, because of Viet Minh shelling. How are, how are aircraft going to land in this airfield? At one point, it comes, it's, it's, very, it's very apparent here that the French troops are virtually on their own. Now, Diem Bien Phu has around seven or eight major fortifications, and what the Vietnamese do is they, they dig trenches up to one fortification. They're eventually going to take that fortification, hold it, use it as a jump-off point for the next major fortification. And by May 7, it'll all be over. But, uh, but having the manpower advantage, at one point, Giap goes with, goes with uh, uh, human wave tactics. Now, that's going to cost the Vietnamese a lot. In fact, by the end of the battle, the French are going to have at least 1,500 dead. The Vietnamese are going to have about 25,000 dead. But they win. Going back to what someone mentioned to me before uh, about the Vietnamese dictum, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, for every man you lose, we'll lose 10, but we're going to win. They are that committed. That committed. However, let's understand one thing here, too. The Geneva Accords were scheduled. Vietnam. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam, Poe's government, is supposed to take part with Russia, China, and what's also known as the Associated State. Now, keep in mind the Associated State was supposed to be Vietnam, but at this stage of the game, the Associated State is going to be South Vietnam. You know, because by after Dien Bien Phu, North Vietnam is going to exist as a separate entity. Politically, you know, the political reality here, and militarily, that's exactly what's going to happen here after Dan Bien Phu. However, the, the, Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese are, interest, are very fascinating here. They're interesting. Ho Chi Minh understands that if he, if he can win at Dan Bien Phu, he'll have a larger say in what's going to be discussed at these Geneva Accords. That's the idea. When on the ground, you have a greater strength of voice at, the, at these discussions. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. This isn't too unlike the British in the War of 1812 against us. 1814, the discussions for the, for the uh, Treaty of Ghent. Keep in mind, in 1814, the British were planning a large invasion of the, of the states here. They were going to move down from Montreal and take Plattsburgh. The, remember the burning of Washington? It was supposed to be the burning. They will take Washington and Baltimore and New Orleans. Remember the Battle of New Orleans with uh, Andy Jackson? Of course, that happens after the war is over with. But the fact of the matter is, the U.S. Navy victory on Lake Champlain, the British do not prosecute, prosecute their case against Plattsburgh. They go back to Montreal. Washington is burned, but the British are stopped at Baltimore. Have to evacuate. And at, it's at this point where Lord Wellington tells the negotiators, hey, look, if we cannot control the Great Lakes, we can't defeat the United States. So what happens at Ghent? The British and the United States sign an accord and the British get out. I mean, they're going to control Canada, but they do not defeat the United States. And in the long, and the, you know, I always remember what John Adams said you know, when the British want, were telling, telling our negotiators that we want northern New York and we want the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley has to go back to the Indians. <laughs> John Adams says, I'll fight this war forever instead of give, in lieu of giving the British an acre. Well, 
What happens? If the British can't prosecute their case with boots on the ground, they make a deal. Same thing's going to happen here. The French are out at Dien Bien Phu. However, let's understand, this th let's understand one aspect of this. There was at one point a discussion in Washington. It was called Operation Vulture. Again, the Russians had exploded an atomic bomb. Ch China goes communist. Uh, the, war in, the war in Korea had been fought to a standstill. North Korea still exists. And in 53, aren't the, aren't the Soviets going to explode a hydrogen bomb? Yeah, they are. They are. There is talk in Washington with this Operation Vulture among the Joint Chiefs of Staff and also John Foster Dulles, remember him? And President Eisenhower. Admiral Rathford of the United States Navy is for this. Nathan Twining, United States Air Force is for this. The idea is to load up 60 B-29s, have them escorted by 150 carrier aircraft in the United States Navy, and bomb the North Vietnamese Army surrounding Dam Ban Phu. And in the words of Nathan Twining, General Nathan Twining of the Air Force, the French can come marching out, marching out singing the Marseillaise. <laughs> At one point, those discussions enlist the use of low-level nuclear bombs to bomb the North Vietnamese. Eisenhower says, if we do that, we'll have to deny it for 20 years. That doesn't happen. But it's discussed. Operation Vulture does not go through. And the French army is defeated. The Accords, Geneva Accords getting into 1954 after this battle. A ceasefire is signed between the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and France. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam will occupy the Vietnam Peninsula, if you want to call it that, from the 17th parallel to the north. And all their troops have to be north, not south. The French, by the way, will continue to occupy Vietnam, but below the 17th parallel. French troops below the 17th parallel. And on each side of the parallel, a five, a five kilometer demarcation line, or demilitarized zone, if you want to call it that. The other agreement, the other agreement, uh, the uh, part of the accords, is virtually an oral, uh, more, a lot of it is an oral agreement. China, the Soviet Union, Britain, of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam agree that there's going to be national elections in this country, 1955. <coughs> the United States does not take part of that agreement. The Associated State of Vietnam, which is considered uh, South Vietnam, does not take part in that agreement. However, uh, there are supposed to be national elections here in 1955 you won't have national elections. In fact, it's in the Pentagon Papers where actually President Eisenhower actually says that he thinks if there are national elections to unify this country, Ho Chi Minh will win 80% of the vote. Well, I don't know if he'd get 80%. He is extremely popular. But I don't think, uh, pre pre I don't think President Bao Dai, who at one point is interesting, he was the uh, emperor of Vietnam, used by the Japanese was deposed by the Viet Minh, and now he's president of the country. And who is his prime minister? Go Dinh Diem. Diem really does not want national elections. He's under no illusion that he would win. <laughs> he's not, you know, he's not going to win, and he knows that. However, there's another aspect of this that's intriguing. Edward Lansdale, how many have ever heard of him? He's an interesting character, CIA type. Was in the Philippines for a while. You know, after the war, you know, Philippines are interesting. Uh, you know, we seem, we, we seem to have an agenda here of picking right-wing extremists. You know, when the war was over, she's laughing over there. When, when the war was over with, General Douglas MacArthur helped to install uh, Manuel Roxas on the seat in the Philippines. Now, Roxas was to the right of center. He was also a Japanese collaborator during the war. I often wondered why, you know, people loved, in this country, they loved MacArthur as a general. Apparently, they didn't want to see him occupy the Oval Office. 
I always remember in, in, in 1953, I guess, in 53, when, uh, when Eisenhower wins the nomination for the Republican, to, to represent the Republicans for the presidential run, for the run for the White House. And for one point, Eisenhower was, was a subordinate to MacArthur. And I guess it's MacArthur's wife who's watching the television, and it comes up on television. You know, Ike, Ike has won the, 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 nomin the, re the Republican nomination to run for president. And she says, oh, Douglas, uh, you know, Ike won. Yeah, that's terrific. He goes, yeah, he was one of the greatest clerks I ever had. <laughs> one of the greatest clerks I ever had. Anyway. Anyway, but this Edward Lansdale is fascinating. He's sent to the Philippines. And what he does here, he brings a man along whose name is Raymond McSaysay. The Huck Rebellion is ongoing in the Philippines. And the Huck are gravitating more and more to the communists. They're peasants. They're peasants, you know, and they want an independent country. They want their land. They want to dig in the dirt. They, you know, again, peasants are not interested in ticker tape, Wall Street ticker tapes. They're interested in the dirt they're digging in. And this, and this backlash, this upheaval, this guerrilla war cannot be suppressed. However, Edward Lansdale, taking a page out of, out of William Howard Taft earlier in the 20th century by giving land to the peasants, brings along this man called Edward McSaysay, who comes along like an American politician, going out to the people asking them what the problems are. How can he solve their problems? And they begin to give land to the people, so the rebellion goes down. And Edward McSaysay, you know, begins to, you know, it's, 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 well, it's kind of tragic in a way. He will die in 1957 in a plane crash. And after he dies, government cor corruption begins to resume again. And we're back to square one. But John Foster Dulles wants to bring Edward Lansdale to Vietnam and have him tutor Diem. Bring him along as an American lackey. Keep in mind, in 1955 here, Diem is beginning to pad his case. And in the 1955 elections here, guess what? He's going to outdo, he's going to do out President Bao Dai. Of course, there are people who consider these elections phony, crooked, whatever the case may be, and he's going to be elected president anyway. The problem with DM is he's not Raymond McSaysay. He has his own agenda. And Lansdale will do with DM what he'd do with McSaysay. He lives in the same house with him, is with him seven days a week, trying to tutor him into being the kind of leader the United States wants. But DM is going his own way here. He's very, very right wing. You know, remember in um, fascist Italy, Mussolini, with the black shirts? Remember that? Yeah. Well, Diem brings along the green shirts. And they have a Nazi, they have a fascist like salute. However, at the same time, according to these accords going on, you know, the, the Geneva Accords, uh, you know, when these accords are agreed upon, there were 300 days where people from the north who wanted to go south were allowed to do so, when people from the south want to go north are allowed to do so, and 900,000 people leave the north to go south. Of course, some of the, a good percentage of these were people who had become Catholic and have no use for the communist north. Many of these people in the south are communist sympathizers or, revol or uh, sympathizers of the revolutionary nationalist agenda. They go north. But keep in mind one thing, and William Colby, remember William Colby from the CIA? He was in the OSS during the Second World War. At one point, will become CIA director. He says both sides were planting people in the north and the south. The problem here is those so-called agents who were sent from the south to the north Apparently, Ho Chi Minh had a pretty good counterintelligence service because practically all of them are rounded up or killed. Some of them are turned and sent back south to work for the North. William Colby said this was a notoriously uh, mismanaged operation. Notoriously mismanaged operation. Diem, though, is not looking to accommodate other agendas except his own. He not only cracks down on the communists, he cracks down on some, on some of the religious groups in the Mekong Delta, the Ho Hao, the Kao Dai, you know, organizations like this, who he could have used. But he cracks down on them, too. It's like he's alienating all segments of the population. 
having said that, you know, he, if he's supposed to have, he's supposed to have a dialogue with the North. He decides he does not really want to have constructive dialogue with the North, and this is becoming apparent in Hanoi. In fact, he cracks down on the communists in 1956. He says they're fomenting rebellion. Arrests what he says are 25,000 communist sympathizers and actually shoots or executes 1,000 of them. But he's spreading this across the board. He's restricting his, he's, he's, he's restricting his followers just to just really the Catholic interests. And they're, they're well endowed financially, so guess where a lot of the money went? To those interests. So he's kind of closeting himself off from the majority of the population. Having done that, he's now going to try to take control of the village system. Remember what I said before about the communists in the village system. Cater to the peasant. I said this last week. You know, each hamlet or each village has, you know, a small village has a constabulary to protect the village. 25, 30, 40, 50 men, depending on the size of the village. This is what Hull organized by putting his cadres or, 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 or commissars, you want to call them that, into these villages. This is the same thing Lenin did to the Tsar's army after 1918, 1917, 1918, and turned it into the Red Army. You know, a, a commander would oversee a division, but a commissar oversees the political education of the troops. Ma was doing, uh, Ho was doing the same sort of thing with the villages by inserting his political representatives in these villages. So, he can, so during the war in the north, the first Indochina war, he could call on these people, these con village constabularies, to join the guerrilla group. Fascinating concept, this. It really is. Fascinating concept. Well, what Diem wants to do is section off South Vietnamese villagers from this so-called communist influence. Because Ho has sent down at least 5,000 cadres to try to take advantage of these villages. Having done that, having done that, and having cracked down on other groups like religious groups, other political groups, you are beginning to see now in 1957, and this is important, you're beginning to see now in 1957 people in these villages taking it upon themselves without political direction and forming armed groups and rising up against the end. That can't be. You know, Ho needs to take advantage of these groups, this uprising, if he's going to make any inroads to unite the South with the North. This is the same situation faced by Lenin in 1917. You know, Lenin's acknowledged as this master revolutionary, yet the uprising in February 1917 in St. Petersburg caught him by surprise. This is why he had to get to Russia to take advantage of this revolution. This wasn't planned. It was spontaneous. You know who were among the leaders of this revolution? And we don't talk about that too much. Women workers in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Wow. Women. Gee. That's interesting. That's fascinating. But Lenin hurries to Russia. Remember the Finland station? Another aspect of this I find fascinating, too. It's the German general staff that agrees to shuttle Lenin into Russia. And he foments the Bolshevik Revolution. And yet, of course, Lenin's obviously not going to see it. And which is the country that's going to steamroller Germany by 1940, Eastern Germany by 1945? The Soviet Union. It's like the Germans cut their own throats. Interesting how, his, interesting how, you know, these, these, how history develops here. But, but Ho finds himself in the same situation. The historical parallels are striking. He needs to take control of these spontaneous uprisings. He sends more cadres into South Vietnam. And, and, and Diem is going to crack down on them. Again, corralling another 65,000 supposed communist, communist sympathizers, executes another 2,000. And this is where the North really turns the heat on. Because as Diem is inserting his own people into these villages, the squads go down from the north. In 1957 and 1958, Ho's gangs, Ho's gangs assassinate 500 South, South Vietnamese government functionaries in the villages. 
1958-1959, another 2,500 are assassinated. And in 1959-1960, another 4,000 are assassinated. In three years, they have, the, North, the North has assassinated 7,000 low-level government functionaries in the villages of South Vietnam. At the same time, inserting their own people. Who controls a lot of the countryside in South Vietnam? DM? No, the North. The North. Almost like a revolution from the bottom up, so to speak. Yeah. Before the first American soldiers really, in mass really hit this country, you might as well say by 1961, folks, <laughs> that decision's already been, that die has been cast, that decision's been made. Guess who's going to win this? It's going to take a while, but guess who's going to win this? The North. The North. Fascinating progression of events here. Absolutely fascinating. And this is what you saw develop. This is what you saw develop from 19, August 1945 to 1961. Of course, keep in mind, I'm going to go into this more in depth next week when I talk about air mobility because uh, that talk next week is interesting because if you don't understand air mobility, you, won't, you really do not understand uh, the, American, uh, the American role here in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War. At this time, during the 1950s, let's understand where America's coming from. You know, we've already fought this war in Korea. The French have been thrown out of Vietnam. Eisenhower, as president, is under the impression here that we, as a country, cannot afford another, another war like, like Korea. And the reason being is, you know, he, he kind of gravitates toward George Kennan's doctrine of containment. Keep it, you know, Kennan's a fascinating character. Now he comes along, he's a Sovietologist, I call him a Sovietologist because that's what he is. Writer, historian, diplomat, I mean the guy does it all here. Comes up with this doctrine of containment after the Second World War. He tries to tell, he tries to tell us that, you know, this, 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 this thing that's been floating around in America in 1945, well, Stalin's the new Hitler. The Soviet, and the Soviet Union is the, is the new threat to world peace. No, they're not. No, they're not. Stalin's interested in security. This is what Kennan understands. He says, if we're going to confront the Soviet Union, the last thing we really need is to have an overbloated military. You know what he says? We can defeat the Soviets by containing them. Our economy is far superior to the Soviet economy. Our political alternative is, is a lot more palatable to people than the Soviet type. Efficient use of, intelligent use of propaganda and limited use of military might in small situations can keep the Soviets contained. This is how he sees the Cold War developing. And he says we can outlast the Soviets with that menu over the length of the Cold War. What happened in 1990? The Soviet Union just collapsed? Was Kennan basically right? Yeah. This was a guy who in, who in 19, 1950, after, after MacArthur landed the troops at Incheon, and the big discussion, do we invade North Korea or do we not invade North Korea? He was against it. He said, you push the North Koreans out of South Korea, stop right there. Containment. Containment. Because he understands, he understands this, that if, that if we go into North Korea, who's going to react? China, because China sees North Korea as a buffer to a Western-oriented South Korea. Kennan understood this. And what happens? As we get closer to the Yalu, what are the Chinese saying? Don't come near the Yalu. Don't come near the Yalu. Don't come near the Yalu. We go near the Yalu. What happens? 300,000 Chinese volunteers. Kennan warned Kennedy not to get involved in Vietnam. He says it's not important to the American agenda. You know what else he's going to say in 2003? At 99 years old, he tells George Bush, don't get involved in Iraq. <laughs> he dies at 101, 2005. But he tells George, gee, was George Kennan right on three counts? So it would appear. So it would appear. 
Having said that, in 54, Eisenhower is gravitating toward this. He does not want to have a large standing army. Sounds like the Founding Fathers. A large standing army is a threat to our Grand Republic, which is why we went with the militia system. This is a little different, though. He does not want to have a large, large conventional army because he thinks it's going to be a drain on our economy. So what happens? Well, in 1954, after the Korean War, we have 20 infantry divisions. Guess what? We're going to be down to 14 by 1957. The Navy will be shaved some ships. They'll lose about 100,000 men. It's the Air Force that gets the nod here. They go from 115 wings to 137. Why? Because the strategic bomber, the B-47, the B-52, can carry the atomic bomb, and that's our deterrent. This is called the New Look Defense. And with the bomber and the atomic bomb, massive retaliation is what it's called. And that's what we're going to build on in the post-Korean War era. At the same time, we are supporting the South Vietnamese. Keep in mind, from January after January 1955, we began to insert so-called military advisors in the South Vietnam. That wasn't started, that wasn't started in 1961. That was started probably February 1955. At the same time, though, at the same time, Eisenhower does not want to have an overbloated military. Kind of goes with what Kennan says. Our economy is the trump card. Our economy is the trump card. It's the trump card of American power. Our economy. Not the military, our economy. What happened to that one? Hmm. Interesting. But this is what you're seeing here. But that's going to change. I'm going to get into this next week. That's going to change with the Kennedy administration. John F. Kennedy is enamored with low intensity counterinsurgency type of warfare which means when Kennedy gets in place, he's going to maintain the nuclear deterrent, but grow the conventional forces. Why? Because at one point, he wants to get into South Vietnam. And I'm going to get into why uh, the last week, you know, we really don't get into, in the, well, he wanted to pull out anyway. There was talk about pulling us, pulling us out. Of course, you know why that, you know why we don't. He's assassinated. But at this point, Yes, you are seeing with the Eisenhower administration not having an overbloated conventional force relying on massive retaliation if it comes to that. Remember the movie Failsafe? Yeah. But as the Eisenhower administration is eased out and the Kennedy administration comes in, JFK is interested in counterinsurgency. And we are going to insert ourselves in Vietnam and, you were, and in two weeks, that last talk uh, is about the feat of a superpower. And I'm going to go into that more in depth. But next week, I am going to, get, I'm going to describe how we go from the horse, from mobility, to the helicopter. And one thing very important about that talk is, I don't know how many of you were attuned to this, but how the atomic bomb influenced the use of the helicopter which people find fascinating. They look at you like, what? Yeah. Yep. And I'll get into that next week. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Two questions. At the, be at the beginning of your talk, I think you alluded to differences between the people of North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And I'm wondering if you could enlarge on that. And the second is, I don't... You said how the North Vietnamese assassinated about 7,000 7, and replaced them with their own. Right. But these replacements obviously would not have had any connection to the, the government of South Vietnam. How right. Did they That's the there? point. That's the point, to yeah, undermine but, DM by inserting they, your own people. So you take control of the villages. Um, the you, I like mean Ho, Ho Chi Minh. As like the local authority. Correct. Correct. Because these villages, keep in mind, as I mentioned last week, come about guerrilla war, these villages are somewhat semi-autonomous. You know, to these villagers, their village at one point is their world. That's their nationality. That's their nationalism, the village. So if you can take control of these village, villages, 
and then unite them in a cause. <laughs> it's almost like you're federalizing the villages into, into, the, into this country called Vietnam. It's essentially what they're doing. As regards to getting back to the differences between people of the North and people of the South, the people of the North were more influenced by China and Confucianism, Confucianism as opposed to the South. So it was easier for the, God bless you, it was easier for the people in the North to gravitate toward a central authority as it was for the people in the South. Which leads me to suspect, leads me to suspect, having said that, that the Tet Offensive of 1968, that butchered the Viet Cong. Now, my take on that might be, being, this, being, being somewhat suspicious, is that was that preordained by the North Vietnamese to get rid of a potential threat once they begin to take over the country. In other words, the Viet Cong were those so-called citizen soldiers on the ground. If we're going to take control of this country, why can't we butcher that army to make sure they don't rise up against us and let the Americans and South Vietnamese army do the butchering for us? I can't say that's actually their mindset. I'm just offering that as a point of discussion. And the reason I offer that is, you go back to Russia, or the Soviet Union, 1944, Operation Bagration, which up to that point was the greatest Allied offensive of the war. It dwarfed Normandy, dwarfed Normandy. In fact, in eight weeks, in the summer of 44, they are gonna, they are gonna, they are gonna destroy the entire German Army Group Center by inflicting 670,000 German casualties in eight weeks. 300, over 300,000 dead alone. Having said that, they went right up to the gates of Warsaw. That's where Stalin stops. The Polish home <coughs> army, looking for Red Army help, rises up against the Nazi occupiers in Warsaw. Stalin doesn't lift a finger. He stays on the Vistula River, stays there, and for eight weeks watches the Nazi, not watch the Nazi riposte, and they butcher the Polish home army. Now, by doing Stalin's dirty work, is the home army around to throw Stalin out after the Russian army moves in? No. So that's why I say, history repeating itself, is this, is, is this an idea that was going through the minds of some of these people in Hanoi? Because after Tet, uh, the Viet Cong, their morale was really shaken. And as in post-Tet, you begin to see the North Vietnamese army taking over more and more and more of the fighting. So if the idea, if the idea was to reduce the Viet Cong as a potential threat to primacy of the North, I offer to you that we, that must be given a strong consideration. Considering if you go back again, like I said, 1957, when the people began the spontaneous uprising against Diem, and Ho has to take control of this before it gets out of control or he's going to lose control of it which is why he sends his murder squads down into South Vietnam and begins to kill these low-level government functionaries in South Vietnamese, from Diem's government to take control of the villages. Fascinating what you see here when you begin to pry this, pull this apart. Absolutely fascinating. Anybody else have any questions, any comments? No? Oh, yes. Maybe you're going to get into this in the, the next lecture, but uh, you know, one of the reasons that I think uh, Kennedy started to rebuild the conventional forces was that uh, he didn't like the uh, uh, only option being nuclear war or nothing. Well, yeah, there, there is something to say about that because nuclear weapons, like any other weapon system, whenever man makes a weapon, what does he do with it? Improve it? Yeah, he does. I mean, if you go back to the Great French War, uh, 1792 to 1815. You know, that's the French Revolutionary Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. You are seeing the Industrial Revolution snowball here. And what is man able to do? Well, if the Industrial Revolution is snowballing, aren't you able to make more weapons? Technology feeds on itself. Each new generation of weaponry reaps a greater harvest of humanity. Hence, we need to conscript. Levé en masse, they called it in France. You're not only conscripting people, you're conscripting the economy. Look at what happened in World War I. Look what happened in World War II. And yes, these, these weapons begin to snowball, not only in numbers, but in virulence. That's what's happening here. 
And you see with the great French, some military historians say the great French war, upwards of six and a half million people died in 23 and a half years. You go to World War I, 15 million people die in four years. You go to World War II, 55 million die in six years. Look where we've come. And then, yes, nuclear weapons, what can you do with that? You know, the, the advantage here, and I'll get into this more next week, the advantage of the, of the nuclear bomb on strategic bombers, look at your World War II when the U.S. and the British were launching these 500 bomber raids over German cities, 700, 1,000 dropping conventional bombs. Well, do you need 1,000 bo bombers with, with atomic weapons to bomb a city now? No. Would a half a dozen do? Maybe. Hiroshima shows you that. Interesting, isn't it? So now you can make three, 400 bombers and just disperse them to a variety of cities. Now, you don't need the 1,000 bomber raid anymore. But what you're seeing with that aspect of air power is what you saw in the First World War. A few planes, guys looking over the cockpit, dropping them out. Now World War II comes along, and now you've got sophisticated bomb sites. Now what do you have? Again, the technology feeds on itself, and our capacity to kill grows immeasurably. So. Anybody else have any questions? No? Yes? What was the uh, argument, uh, the feeling between Truman and Eisenhower? I never, uh, they disliked one another. Why? Give them hell, Harry? <laughs> Uh, Harry Truman had a tendency to speak his mind. Now, maybe that's one of the reasons. You know, Eisenhower was basically the diplomatic type. Having said that, he was probably the right choice to oversee the Allied armies in Europe. Uh, if you're acquainted with the baggage he had to put up with, Patton, Montgomery, uh, Britain versus America, so on and so forth, De Charles de Gaulle, uh, he had a lot of baggage. And then I, he was in between Churchill and Roosevelt, too. Um, as opposed to Harry Truman, who, <laughs> when uh, Vyacheslav Molotov came here, when Truman first got in office to renegotiate, well, or to talk about the Lend-Lease Lend -Lease aid to going to the Soviet Union, and Truman read him up and down. And he says, if you know, if you if you stuck to your agreements, and he used he used stable language on on uh, Molotov, and Molotov it wasn't used to being talked to it like that. Mm -hmm. And so probably uh, maybe because of Truman's off the cuff approach in certain respects, maybe that's what turned Eisenhower off. Um, I can't say for sure, but uh, you know after but Eisenhower learned a lesson from Truman. He understood that you know. Truman did not resort, to, he did not go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war to get us involved in Korea. That was through the UN. And look what happened. It wasn't a victory, it wound up as a stalemate. So in 1954, when pressure was building on President Eisenhower to send, possibly send American troops, or at least those bombers, against the North Vietnamese at Dien Bien Phu, and afterwards, Eisenhower said, I want congressional approval for this. He's not going to. He's not going to. He's not going down by himself. He wants congressional approval. In other words, here you have a president perhaps resorting to the Constitution again, going before Congress and asking for a declaration of war. But you have to justify that. Look at Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> well, Franklin, that was a cakewalk for FDR, December 8th. You don't think you don't think Congress is not going to give him the declaration of war he asked for? Yet, if you go back to uh, August, uh, oh, it was April 2nd, 1917, when Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and urged Congress to give him that, you know, the declaration of war that he wanted, Congress had, had to deliberate for four days. They don't give it to him until the 6th. And not everybody was willing to give it to him. But more, more than enough were needed to pass, and it passed. And America gets involved in the First World War. But yeah, Eisenhower uh, at least learned that lesson from Truman. Uh, he was not going to get involved unless he had uh, support from Congress. Because keep in mind, Truman, you know, to stop the communists in North Korea uh, from, from taking the South, uh, went along with the UN. Well, you know, that's probably one of the greatest examples of the UN operating together, is Korea. 
because they used that term collective security. Remember that one? That was used in the 30s against, uh, to justify the League of Nations approach to the Nazis. But that was only possible because the Soviet Union walked out. Correct, correct. But it's, it's, still, it's still kind of, it's, an interesting, it's, 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 it's interesting to look back on that in the United States, Britain, France, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Philippines, Thailand, you know, all getting involved here to, uh, to throw the North, Kore North Koreans out of South Korea. But then again, you look at George Kennan saying, okay, this is where we cut it off. And he's, his voice is drowned out by MacArthur, and later Truman draw, jumps onto this. Oh, we, you know, no, we, we have to free North Korea. And so it's united but with uh, Syngman Rhee. And the Chinese get involved. And that was another thing about getting involved in North Vietnam. Uh, you know, sending American troops into North Vietnam to help the French. General Ridgway was against it. And General Ridgway said, if we're going to help the French to unite uh, Vietnam, it's going to take at least seven U.S. divisions. If the Chinese get involved, at least 12 U.S. divisions. And the United States doesn't get involved. I mean, American, did, did the American people support the Korean War in mass? Not really. So what do you think they're going to do? What excuse are you going to use for Vietnam? This, this, is where, this is the problem America approaches after the Second World War. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. OK, it's like my father said. You know, Gee, we knew what the hell we were fighting for. You know, the, the recruiting offices on December 8th, many of them, their lines were out the door, down the street, and around the corner. Uh, that really doesn't happen too often anymore. You know, uh, even after 9-11. Did that happen? Yeah. Not to the extent of December 8th. So Americans can be very touchy as involved getting in a war. You can be very touchy about that. What's in it for us? Which is the proper question to ask. What is in it for us? You knew what was in it. You knew what you were in for in, on December 8th. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Anybody else have any questions? Or any comments? We're done.